Welcome, everybody. I think most of you were here last week. Um, if you weren't, definitely please feel free to type anything in the chat box if you have any questions or um, if you need help with anything, any technical difficulties. Mm -hmm. Anybody mm -hmm. need the subtitles put up? I know someone was having audio issues last week. So if we need subtitles, um, just toss that in the chat and I'll be happy to add that on for anybody. Or if it's just easier to read than it is to hear anything that you need. Um, otherwise, I will turn it over to you, Loretta, so that we can go ahead and get underway. And thank you all for being here with us tonight for the first time, or again, if you were with us last week. Thank you, Laura. And you could probably stop our uh, screen share for the moment so everybody can kind of see each other there and our beautiful faces from wherever we are from. <laughs> well, um, just, except now I see all the things that need my hair. <laughs> Oh, that's a problem. You know, you go, oh, oh my God, I thought I called that. Oh, so wow. last week we started some holy and enriching conversations and we gave strength to each other in um, as we listened in our small groups and shared mm -hmm. our stories. And we talked about saying goodbye to fear and how our biggest fears are the opposites of what we truly value. Mm -hmm. Fears are signposts to what we really desire. And we named our fears and flipped them over to try to get to our greatest desires. So for example, if you had a fear of dark, you might realize that you have a real value on light, which if you look a little deeper, might be that you need to trust more. The fear of the dark is something that leads for a longing for greater trust. We imagined getting to know women who knew Jesus, women who witnessed the resurrection. As women, we can't always relate to the scriptures, what's going on, because very few stories feature women. Uh, I'm not sure any depict the perspective from a woman's point of view. A pious practice we Catholics have is praying and talking to the saints. We believe that people who have died can pray with us and for us. And so we talked to the women of the resurrection. We imagined that we accompanied the women to uh, the tomb as they were grieving, where maybe they even felt fear as they were um, encountering these mighty beings, these angels. And we recognized that even though they are little mentioned in scripture, women played important roles in Jesus's life and in the early church. There are holy women everywhere. I'm looking at a bunch of them. We like them have important roles to play. Tonight or today on the West Coast, we will ask ourselves if our deepest desires match God's deepest desires for us. Because deep down, what we most deeply desire is to live in freedom freedom from fear, and in connection with God. And isn't that just what God wants for us too? So let's start as we did last time with some lyrics from the hymn, Ye Sons and Daughters. Uh -huh. And that'll begin our prayer together. And then we'll go from there into imaginative prayer. So let us begin. Mm -hmm. Breathe in God, exhale all anxiety. And Mary asked in tears of woe, O gardener, where did his body go? O Mary, look and see your Lord. Alleluia. Picture a master gardener whistling in a floppy hat, pruning shears in hand, smiling. God is the gardener from Eden on, always laboring. Picture yourself in the resurrection garden now. See Jesus. Let Jesus love you. 
and spend a quiet moment talking to the master gardener. Jesus tells us in a parable that he is the vine and his father is the gardener. And that God prunes away any part of us that is not bearing fruit. God takes hold of me, studies me, and helps me to see areas where I could produce more fruit. I'm tempted to grab the pruning shears out of God's hands and... Point them at somebody else. Jesus says to us, without me, you can do nothing. The opposite is also true. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And in the silence, pray for all of the women who are on this call, wherever we may be. And let us give thanks to God who takes joy in each of us. Thank you, Jesus, for getting up from the dead, for promising us resurrection, for connecting us and helping us turn away from fear. Amen. Women in Conversation is all about women sharing their real stories of their real lives and some of the challenges that we face. So let's do a quick check-in here and see how you reached out to at least one other woman during uh, the past week since we last met. Remember last time we talked about how can I connect with other women? So let's do a quick check-in. Feel free to jump in. <laughs> I reached, this is Phyllis, and I reached out to other women by talking to them about the Chosen series. I talk about it nonstop, and um, it has become, it has grounded me in so many ways. That's what I talk about. It's a great way of imagining Christ mm -hmm. in a loving relationship with lots of people we may not have thought about before. Right. Thank you. Okay, so I'm, okay. I met with a group of women and we talked about doing projects, uh, coming up with projects to go out and help the community. So we haven't come up, I mean, we, you know, one is nursing home, but we want to go reach out to other venues and, um, and just be a vehicle to, to them and help them. Thank you, Anita. I reached out to a neighbor um, that used to live near me. They they go up north. They're a snowbird. But um, his name is Abraham. And I listened to a podcast. It's on. Um, it's and he wrote a lot of books, Covenant of Water, and and he just talks about the difference between fixing and healing. And it's a powerful podcast if you get to look for it. And because my friend Abe actually went to school with this author, 
So I knew, and he says he doesn't listen to podcasts. But I talked to him and his wife for a while and I told him that he would remember his voice if he listened. So he might listen. Thank you, Joanne. <laughs> and, it, you know, that points out something that we can reach out to people wherever they are. But I reached so out to a cousin. Oh, who's who is that? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to talk over you. I was just going to share that today I talked to my cousin who I hadn't spoken to in, golly, a year and a half. She and I were the best of friends. In fact, I wrote about her in the Friends chapter because we were thick as thieves for all growing up years. But, you know, as you um, have children and grandchildren, you don't necessarily connect as often as you'd like. That was a great conversation. I reached out to a few people this week. One was a similar, a cousin whose birthday was this week. And she's a single mom, never married, but adopted a little boy who turned out to be autistic. Um, and she's raised him on her own. And he just graduated from high school. And, um, you know, she and she just had sh sh shoulder surgery. And he's really been taking care of her because she lives a little bit of a distance away. Oh. And her sister just moved to North Carolina. So, um, you know, he's been a big support for her. And, you know, I, I try to call as often as I can and occasionally we get together. But that was a nice thing for me to make the connection again this week. Thank you. Jane, did you want connections, to? Connections, connections. Yes, Jane, you were had raised your hand. Can you hear me? Yes. I have weekly meetings with I'm on the West Coast and I have weekly Zoom meetings with some with a, another woman on the East Coast. And we've been doing this for about two years. And with every meeting, I will mention to her how my communication with God, how having having God direct me and and attempting to follow God's will what a difference it has made in my life. And I started it and now we're both talking about it. And it's been oh. really, really fulfilling. And then the other thing that I'm doing, there's um I think I think it's a podcast. I um that's on every morning, the God Minute. And I'm talking to people about that too, because it's how I start my day. So that's what I'm doing. Thank you so much, Jane. So we're all reaching out in various ways. So thank you all of us who have shared and I'm sure all of you have been very busy this week as well. So just like in the book, um, we will next look for inspiration from a female saint and then hear a story from an ordinary woman, move into small groups to discuss how her story touches our story and then return to the large group for any takeaways, uh, key points. And then um, talk about how we might wanna act moving into the future, asking the Holy Spirit to give us the courage to take action in our parish and our neighbor. Yeah. So lots to do in the time that we have left. So we're gonna jump in. Right. Can you see Mary Magdalene? No. Some oh, can. Yes. yes. Okay, yes. good. So now we can. Yes. Our inspiring woman this week is a woman in the early church called the Apostle to the Apostles. Mary Magdalene has long been celebrated on July 22nd, but it wasn't until 2016 that her Memorial Day was elevated to a feast. The egg she holds is a symbol of resurrection. It appears to be a dead object, but life can spring form and forth in the form of a chicken or something else. She is the one Jesus chose to appear to first. She was tasked with bravely telling the men that Jesus was alive. A meditation with her can be found on page 42 in your books in the session on friendship. Friendship plays an important role in women's lives. 
friends are people who are connected in some way. They know our flaws. They love us anyway. They console us, laugh with us, and share our stories, and hopefully pray with us. God gives us the gift of friendship, building up the body of Christ as we make connections. Mary Magdalene traveled with a community of women following Jesus. We don't get any details from scripture. She must have carried the news of the resurrection to those women. With whom can I share the joy of resurrection moments I experience? St. Jerome thought that the name Magdalene or Magdala was a reward for Mary's faith and actions. Magdala meaning the tower. Mary the tower. No early Christian author identifies a city called Magdala in the Sea of Galilee area. Its underlying meaning means the magnified one. We know that she stood faithful to Jesus at his crucifixion and she followed his body to the tomb when it was over. Mary Magdalene has been accused of prostitution, adultery, and other crimes, yet the New Testament is clear. Mary Magdalene was not a notorious sinner, but a woman cured of diseases. Seven demons, according to St. Luke in chapter 8 of his gospel. In those days, mental illness was often considered a demonic possession. Mary the Tower helped support the ministry based on her means, according to the Gospel of Luke. Perhaps she was wealthy, who knows? We do know she can be a patron to anyone who suffers an attack on their good name. She can be a model of us, uh, for us of humility, a virtue Jesus encourages always. The apostles did not believe her when she said Jesus is risen. She was likely minimized, even though she might have been Jesus's best friend. Exclusion can be a path to holiness. When we're excluded, ridiculed, disbelieved, ignored, we stand at the cross. Not my favorite place, but a place to which we are all called. We stand in a poverty of spirit. This is exactly what the Beatitudes call us to do. Luke chapter 6 says, Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude and insult you. Rejoice and leap for joy on that day. Behold, your reward will be great in heaven. For their ancestors treated the prophets in the same way. So we are in good company. Exclusion is a path to holiness. Can I embrace with gratitude that place of Calvary? And as I accept, even embrace humility, can I work gently for change? Can I possibly even desire and ask for this kind of poverty? I'll pause a moment, give you a chance to just let that sink in a little bit. Definitely a lot of different food for thought. At the heart of Women in Conversation are the stories that women share. So today, I'll risk to share a small part of mine. My mom was 40 when she discovered she was pregnant with me. She already had five kids and the brother two years older than me, pictured on dad's lap, had a major heart defect at birth. And he would die of a brain aneurysm at five. When mom was 45, she got pregnant with my little sister. It could not have been an easy life. 
Some days I would catch her in her bedroom with my brother's baby book. And she would quickly shut it and put it in a drawer and tell me never to open that drawer. It was only after I was a mother that I began to understand the grief that she kept hidden inside. When I was seven, mom had to explain to me what abortion meant because it was a word I had heard in conversations people had with her over and over again. My mother said she would never, never have considered abortion for me or my younger sister, despite the people who told her, you're foolish to carry that child to term. My sister grew up to become a daughter of charity and she now helps lead her community from Paris. She lives here at Rudebach the site of Marian apparitions to St. Catherine Labore. My mother was brave. And based on these and other life experiences, I'm very pro-life. Well, we had two biological children and I wanted more. And my husband thought the baby part was just too difficult. And he said, hmm, you know, there's a lot of children out there that probably need good homes maybe we should adopt. I prayed really, really hard and I decided, okay, let's see if we can try to adopt. Well, when we approached the adoption agencies in California, they discouraged us due to the high abortion rate at that time. And the birth mothers, unable to parent themselves, were choosing couples with no children. So we would be at the end of a long, long list. People have asked, well, why didn't you foster adopt? But we felt that we wanted a child in a permanent situation. We didn't feel called to a temporary situation. And so we pursued an out of country debt adoption to help women who could not parent their children. I guess you could say we wanted to excel in our chosen field of being parents as a career. It took a vigorous vetting process and lots of intrusive questions and more than a year and a half before we could connect with and adopt a five and three-year-old sister and brother in a Colombian orphanage. I soon discovered as we built our little blended family that strangers felt free to ask very probing questions and to challenge our decision. I mean, who did we think we were to be tearing children out of their culture and raising them in a distant country? Or you're a white woman. What business do you have raising Hispanic children? And I always felt that to have a home with loving parents was a blessing, even if we could not offer them the fullness of their culture. But a lot of questions hurt and, you know, you just have to live with them. Then people would say, well, couldn't you and your husband have any more biological children? Well, again, not exactly their business either. Then there was the librarian who thought I was a predator and asked my son if I was bothering him. I explained I was his mother. She gave me a funny look. And she asked my son if it was true. I'm sure you have a lot of questions because I've had many offered to me over the years, like the cashier who looked at my son funny and said, hmm, he must look like his father. And I said, yes, he does. Um, of course, the story is much longer, but this piece of it is here to show the connections between my value on family and our choices and what we do. Our adopted daughter is now the mother of three, working from home in a job she loves, living too far away in Florida. And our adopted son got married last fall. They are expecting their first child. I connected them through a blind date, but that is a whole different story. And as miracles would have it, when I opened myself to the vocation to being a parent, I'm gonna get to babysit my adopted son's son next January when mom goes back to work. 
all four of our children have good loving relationships with each other. Being a mom and a grandma has taught me a lot about receiving and giving unconditional love. When our first daughter was born, I thought my heart would burst. I had no idea a heart could grow like that. And now I can see why God's love burst into a big bang of this universe. Love just explodes. And someone said to me, I will only have one child. I could never love someone the way I loved my first child. Well, I just couldn't agree with that. My parents taught me that God's protective love connects us with others in love. And I learned that pro-life means that every life counts, especially the poor who are neglected and mistreated by society. These countless lives, victims of war, people without homes. These are the people we must value equally with the unborn. To be pro-life is to love everyone, no exceptions. So I am sure that you're going to have a lot to say about my story in your small groups. So here are some questions to spark that conversation. And before we move into the small groups to discuss what in my story touches your story, let me say that every woman has a story worth sharing. The Women in Conversation model begun in Sacramento in 2015 was never set up lecture style with some woman expert paid to address us. Inspiring women are all around us. Each small group is filled with us and inspiring women live down the block and in the next apartment. So if you don't know how to use the chat where the questions will be placed, uh, take a screenshot or take a photograph and um, that will help you. Um, and start with the question, what in Loretta's story that you heard today resonates with your story? your story. So what woman has been a tower of strength in your life? Who helps you be courageous? Who's the person that you can most connect with in talking about your faith? Is God inviting you to connect with someone in a new, new way? And how will you know? Is there a welcoming place for women at your parish? And how have you noticed that your values connect with the choices and the actions that you uh, make every day in your life. So Laura's gonna send us into small groups and we will be back in about 15 minutes yeah. to share the major takeaways you may have had as we listen to one another. You might have an aha moment I just ask you, when you come back to the large group, if you're sharing someone else's story, do it confidentially. Do it from your own perspective. And I would say that um, when you get the one minute warning, quickly choose one woman who could share a key point from your group. Unfortunately, we just don't have all the time in the world. So enjoy your conversations and we'll see you back here shortly. Thank you so much, Loretta. And you should see an invitation to join your rooms right about now on your screens. If you have any trouble, say the word. I'm happy to help. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. If you're from our breakout groups, everybody else will be rejoining us in 11 seconds, not to be precise. <laughs> <laughs> I hope your groups were fruitful discussions. Oh, it was beautiful. Yeah, I I checked in with every small group and I feel like we have some rock star women sharing. You guys know how to do it. So I am putting my email out there. So you guys feel free to reach out to me. Uh, Renew International cannot share your email um, in this uh, 
that this idea. venue unless you choose to do so. Mm -hmm. So if you would like to share your email with others, maybe you had such a great conversation, you want to connect with one mm -hmm. another, feel free to put that into the chat at this time. Yeah, I'll do it. So we're going to take a couple of minutes to share major takeaways from your large group and be thinking about what action you might like to take following this conversation. Renew is very good about encouraging uh, small groups to pray together, to connect, to share stories, and then mm -hmm. take action. So it's not just navel gazing. So who would like to share from their large group, small group? Thank you, Jane. Thank oh. you, Eleanor. Okay. So are we sharing verbally or in chat? Verbally. Okay. Oh, email addresses in the chat. Anything, if there were major takeaways, um, we can share those together in the group. Okay, so th these are my notes and Eleanor and Kim are going to also add to it. So this is what I wrote, the dream of the dream of a larger family um, and, and the fulfillment. Um, that Mary Magdalene, uh, um, I, is it Magdalena, translates to the tower. I don't know what language. And so Mary Magdalene was the tower. Jesus was the rock. And I, I thought that was just absolutely perfect. Um, and the picture, the video that we saw, the, the need in that picture, you know, people who, who children who appeared to be um, evacuating and it was, it was emotional. We, I, well, we talked about friends, um, family members. I mentioned my auntie and we talked about the courageous women in our lives and the courageous women in my, in my opinion, coming from me and, and my own experience that I don't acknowledge enough and notice enough. And that's all I have. Thank you, Jane. Appreciate that. We have two other groups. Who would like to jump in? Anybody from uh, Colette, Ginger, Mary, or Phyllis, if you guys selected someone to speak, would they like to speak now? Yeah, Jin Ginger's going to speak before this um, St. Croix rain comes down hard tonight. Let me talk fast. The, <laughs> um, we, we, um, we talked about the courageous women in our lives turned out to be, uh, for the majority, our mothers who um, were, were mothers to large groups of children who made them feel so loved and with through their uh, strong faith, encouraged their children to to be good citizens and, and lovers of people. And then we also spoke about the different um, ways we um, have groups in, in the parishes. Uh, during COVID, some people had a hard time getting back afterwards. In um, Brooklyn, our, um, our prayer warriors, we met during COVID on Zoom and that helped to keep us closer together. And um, we still keep up with each, each other every day before we meet at church. And also um, meeting in bereavement groups, um, Mary and I have that, that in common. Colette and Phyllis were just wonderful and um, just faithful people. And talking about uh, n meeting new friends and new women who have come into their lives and helped change their faith and strengthen their faith. So I wanna thank, I, Thank them for having such a wonderful group. Thank you, Ginger. Appreciate that wonderful sharing. And we have one more group. Who, who's going to talk? Joanne. <laughs> Joy, <Julia>, talk. <laughs> You're sick. <her. laughs> I, I we shared about how some kind of a, a a hardship for our children makes us understand and appreciate life and see joy even in the midst of tragedies sometimes and 
and increases our faith how sometimes we're rejected when we want to do something within the church so we do it ourselves and it starts something and i thought that was really good thank you very much well this uh wonderful strength that we can encourage one another to stand up and do what needs to be done even if like mary magdalene experienced the men didn't believe her or listen so what would you like to do for your action this coming week? We'll start next time with those actions. Maybe you want to connect with a new small group of women in your neighborhood. Meet somebody for coffee. Um, ask where they notice God in their work or their world. Um, or talk about with somebody what you're most grateful for. Have the courage to open a conversation with uh, somebody about God. So... This is proof that you could put a group of strangers together and they can connect in meaningful ways because of our shared love and giftedness as unique images of the Most High. Um, all right, so looking ahead to next week, that'll be the last gathering of this three series. Um, we'll share more stories of amazing women and I hope the seeds in this small group will grow. And next time we'll exchange emails again, um, make connections because God is a connector. God is all about connection. You know, when Jesus was arrested, the apostles scattered. They forgot about their connectedness. When divided, they were weakened. And the women stayed at the cross. They stayed. So let's follow their example. And in connecting, God gives us the perfect model of connections in the Holy Trinity. So I'm going to invite everybody to just mute because it sounds kind of eh, wonky when everybody tries to sing together. And I will just sing the closing prayer. But I invite you, if you know the song, to go ahead and sing along in your mutedness, <laughs> if that makes sense. So we begin in the name of the Father who created us and the Son, our brother, and the Holy Spirit who is all around us. Abba, Abba Yeshua, Yeshua Ruach. Our God is with us. Abba, Abba Yeshua, Yeshua Ruach, we thank you for all. We thank you for all. Amen. See you next week. Thank you so much for being here. Have a great weekend. Thank everybody. you. Thank, thank you very you much. Thank you. Nice Bye, Laura. Have a good week. Bye. Thank you very much.